Jimmy Rain is the founder and CEO of Great Southern Wood Preserving, based in Abbeville, Alabama. Great Southern is one of the country's largest treaters of lumber. So basically they take raw lumber from other companies' sawmills primarily and apply chemical preservatives to ensure that it lasts a lifetime. And based on Great Southern's $2 billion of 2022 sales, we estimate that the company is worth about $1 billion. Jimmy actually took over the company when the father of his first wife tragically died in a car accident in 1970. He was a farmer, and like most farmers, he was land rich, but cash poor. So the CPA that was advising the family said, sell the tractors, sell the plows, sell all the personal property, but don't sell any land. And this little treating plant sat on six and a half acres of land next to the farm. And so they did that. They sold everything except this one little treating plant. And they had one offer from Mr. Ralph Reynolds here in Abbeville, he was a Popewood dealer. He offered them $14,000 for the little treating plant. And that, and the six and a half acres that it sat on. The brother wanted to take it. My wife was trying to do what the CPA told her. So they kind of got in a disagreement and I was in law school trying to mediate my first case. So I came up with the idea that I would lease the land and sell the equipment. So I made an offer to them, well, I'll buy the equipment for $10,000 and I'll lease the land and everything will go away and I'll stay in law school and I'll finish. So my father said, Jimmy, that's a very good idea, but what happens if you can't sell it? You're gonna sign a note for $10,000, but if you can't, oh, dad, I can sell it. I'm sure I can sell it, but if, what if you can't? Anyway, he was right. I couldn't sell it. So now I've got a treating plant. So I finished law school and came back here and opened a one-room law office on the courthouse square. Two black telephones. This would ring, I'd say, Jimmy Rain Law Office. This would ring, I'd say, Great Southern Wood Preserve. So that's how it started, me and one other fellow, Austin Curry. Back then, the company was doing less than $100,000 of sales, so a fraction of you know, what it does today. It had no cash, no money, and money is the lifeblood of any business. And I struggled for a long, long time trying to run the business. I would get up at 4.30 in the morning and go out and meet Lawson, and we would get everything ready and start treating, I'd come back and take a shower, practice law till 4.30, then I'd go back and, and stay with him until we got finished. Things really started to take off in the mid 80s when Jimmy attended a Harvard Business School program for the owners and managers of family owned private companies. Um, and he was inspired by a case that he studied there about how Frank Perdue used marketing effectively to turn commodity chicken into a household name. Every time I would walk into a building supply store and try to talk to them about my product, the only question they asked, what's your price? And I knew we had the best product. I knew we had the highest quality. I knew the extent that we were going to to make a high quality product and to give service, but it didn't matter. So I needed some way to get the attention of that dealer. I wanted to find some emotional thread that would weave through my area, and that was college football. Jimmy had this insight based on his love of college football and the love of college football across the South, that if he were to bring in the big college football coaches, not only at his alma mater, Auburn, um, but at rival Alabama and others throughout the South, if he were to bring them in as spokespeople, that would you know really help grow his brand. And that certainly turned out to be the case. I had known Pat for a long time. We became friends, but when he got the job at Auburn in 81, and I went to Harvard in 84, 85, and 86. And the idea came to me when I was at Harvard to try and use marketing to uh, differentiate my product. So I came back and I talked to Pat about it first. And he said, well, we'll try it, see how it works. Like this fence, built with us most pressure treated pine from Great Southern Wood, the lumber with a 40 year guarantee. Speaking of extra defense, Ring ain't let me keep this. So after years of doing commercials with the coaches, he'd sort of actually created this own character and brand for himself. 
And you could argue maybe at that point, he didn't really need the coaches as much. So when he was thinking about, you know, with his marketing team, what the next phase of the company's advertising uh, would look like, um, he, he ended up drawing on his love for old Westerns and created this character called the Yellow Fella, who is a cowboy played by Jimmy. When we first started, we were using actors and nothing was catching on. Marty Marshall was my marketing professor at Harvard. And so I talked to Marty and he said, well, he said, I think the problem you're having is that people are not connecting. It's just another commercial. I really didn't have any plans to be on camera, but they walked in one day and had this uh, storyboard for this cartoon cowboy. And I said, do you, you really want me to do that? And it was really, I thought, hokey, cartoonish. And it sort of evolved into Yellow Fella. Who are you, Mr. Fella? Yellow Fella. I thought you were dead. Not hardly. I wanted to replicate the Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, John Wayne, figures of my youth. Being in your 60s and out playing cowboys and Indians was a lot of fun. I mean, we were shooting these commercials in the location that John Ford and John Wayne used. It was like being a kid again, riding horses and shooting guns. And I mean, you just don't think about the other side effects that, okay, now when people see this, they're gonna recognize you. So, but that was kind of different for me. I said, I came here to rebuild the town with Yellowwood. Best there is for building outdoors. Abbeville, Alabama, where Jimmy lives today and where he started the company and has kept it ever since, is probably not exactly where you would expect to find the richest guy in Alabama. It's a small town of 2,000 people, about a three hour drive from Atlanta. Jimmy grew up there, his family had been there long before he was born, and he's chosen to keep his company there I and mean, live there today. And I think a big part of the attachment that he feels is the critical role that his own dad, who everyone in Abbeville knows as Mr. Tony, played in the town's development in the 1950s. My dad was a real entrepreneur. He came back here after World War II. He wanted to open a nice restaurant, and he did. It was called the Village Inn. Well, Mr. Homer Carter was president of Pepper Manufacturing in Opelika. And so he used to come through uh, Abbeville on his way to his beach house at Panama City. And he loved to stop at the restaurant and eat dad's spaghetti. So Mr. Homer came in one day and he started asking dad, he said, Tony, he said, what kind of town do y'all have here? What kind of water supply? What kind of mayor? I've got a plant that I want to build and open as a textile plant and I'm trying to find a location to, to to put it. So they started talking and giving him all this information. He said, well, can you get the president of the Chamber of Commerce? And he said, we don't have a chamber. He said, oh, well, I'm sorry. We can't come any place. They don't have a chamber. And dad said, oh, oh, boy, we'll get you one. So they organized one and he became the first president. And Mr. Carter's decision was between Abbeville and Cuthbert, Georgia. And I always say that Dad's Spaghetti is the one that won it. So he chose Abbeville and they came to town with 25 employees and they started sewing uptown on the square. And they grew that plant from 25 to 1400. To live here and grow up here was idyllic. I mean, it was um, everything that you've ever seen in old movies. Uh, that was what it was like. And then, NAFTA came along and destroyed it. it. At that time, that building sat on 53 acres and 550,000 square feet under roof. Huge plant. I mean, it was terrible. And from then through the 90s, if you rode through Abbeville in 1996, it'll lock your door and kept going. There was burned out buildings and boarded up buildings. It was just a devastated community. So within the last few years, that plant was still sitting empty. Um, and years ago, to avoid it being sold to a salvager, Jimmy bought the plant and paid years worth of taxes and, and interest and the like before he could figure out what to do with it. And then 
In 2018, Hurricane Michael happened and demand for wood basically went through the roof and the company went to its suppliers, the sawmills, and said, we need X amount of wood and they couldn't meet that demand. So in order to cushion the company against future situations like that, Jimmy actually opened one of his company's first sawmills at the old pepperel plant in Abbeville in 2019. I think that was a moment of pride for him. He went from being liable for years to now, we got about 110 people out there making an average of $22 an hour. So that's been sort of a great inspiration to me that we were able to bring that back and bring that kind of prosperity back. And it's made a big difference in the town. And you look at our sales tax revenue and just the whole economy around Abbeville has really been improved because of that facility. Thanks to the success Jimmy's had, he's been able to really give back to that community. And he spent, you know, millions of his own dollars to to revitalize the town to look like it did when he was a kid. I wanted to build Hugging Molly's because it brought back a time for me that was very special when I was a kid. I would go uptown on the square to Central Drugstore and you'd go in there after school and you'd get a fountain drink. So we tried to replicate Central Drugstore with Hugging Molly with the soda fountain and the stools and the carbonated water and the drinks. Most of the buildings downtown have been replicated back to the way they were originally constructed. And rather than build one giant big office building, we would put different offices in some of the buildings. So it would bring the building back to life and it would bring the town back to life. And we tried to go back and restore them as I remember them in the 50s. Jimmy started this foundation called the Jimmy Rain Foundation, which is education focused and funds partial scholarships for college students. And the way that the foundation funds itself is primarily through a charity golf tournament that it runs every year. One of our employees, she had a, a daughter and a son. And the little, I knew both of them very well. And the little girl was just such a bright, shining child. Her whole life, all she talked about was, I want to be a doctor. And she never wavered from kindergarten through grade school through high school. So she went to Auburn. Her father ran a tire store here, and her mother worked for us in accounting. And at that time, Auburn didn't have a great scholarship program, but I tried to help her, and she got uh, a small one. I guess I became distracted. I don't know. But her father died, passed away. And before I really knew it, she had dropped out of college because she couldn't afford it. Oh, that just broke my heart. It devastated me. And uh, I said, this is not right. It's not right. We can't, we got to do something. I don't know what, but we're going to do something. So we decided right then and there that we were going to start this foundation and we were going to make sure it was the best we could. That wasn't gonna happen again. Jimmy has been able to draw on the relationships that he made over so many years working with the college coaches to you know, bring in big names like Peyton Manning, whose dad was in a commercial with Jimmy, Herschel Walker, who was you know, a big name, Georgia running back. So his ability to bring those big names is really a big draw for people who wanna to pay to play in the tournament. And as a result of that, the foundation's been able to fund more than 500 partial scholarships to date. In the first year, we raised money. We didn't have enough money to give a scholarship. The next year, we gave one. And then the next year, we gave two. And now we give over 50 a year, and we've given out over 560. And I said that first night, I said, I hope I'm standing here, and we give out a 1,000. God willing, I will. <laughs>